All right, everyone, welcome back to the weekly roundup edition of On the Margin. I am uh, co-host Michael Ippolito, and I am joined, as always, by my bombastic co-host, Tyler Neville. <laughs> God, I love these. these I'm going to get a thesaurus just so I can keep coming up with these. We're like yeah. three episodes in here, and I'm already running out of good words, you know. <laughs> Um, That's the best. There's so many that. wonderful adjectives to describe you, Tyler. You know, I just got so many good angles that Thanks I can talk about. about. Glad yeah. I'm not boring. No, you keep it interesting. How's the week been? I know you're feeling you're feeling a little under the weather yesterday. Oh yeah, I got the uh, second Pfizer vax, and that thing kicked my ass. I mean, mm. I was in bed all day, but today I'm feeling you know cl- close to a hundred percent now. So getting back there. Good. Nothing fires you up like talking about macro and crypto on oh, a podcast, right? That's what yeah. got you out of bed in the morning, baby. Love it. Love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, are you going to comment? I'm, I'm on a, I got a new background here. I got a oh, new yeah. background. I'm looking. It looks very white right Is that now. plant real or is, is that fake? It is a real plant. Real plant. <laughs> yes. Wow. I know. That's, dude, uh, you're getting mature now because you know, real plants, you actually have to water I got those. plants. You know what? I actually, I found, uh, funny you bring up that plant. I found a nice little place in Greenpoint. It's called uh, Feng Shui, a little play on Feng Shui. Um, and it's a plant shop. They got a lot of very interesting plants. So This you know episode what? is brought to you by Feng Shui. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> we are um, not getting paid by Feng Shui. <laughs> we are absolutely not, no. This place does not have a budget for sponsorship, let me just tell you. But uh you might, yeah, stay tuned because there might be some interesting plants making their way right up here. That's all I'm going to say. We haven't talked about what we're going to talk about in this segment outside of uh, decorating um, my apartment here, but a lot of interesting stuff this week. So Peter Thiel made some comments about Bitcoin as being a potential uh, uh, Chinese financial weapon against the U.S. So we're going to go deep, deep into that and we'll get your, uh, your tinfoil hats ready for that discussion. Uh, we're going to talk about an uptick in share buybacks for U.S. firms. And we're going to talk about State Street. Uh, They're lending out their technology to a new crypto uh, platform to trade. And then finally, we're going to talk about Coinbase uh, Q1 earnings, which were blowout earnings. I don't know what people were expecting, but big, big earnings uh, for Coinbase there. So why don't we get started with Peter Thiel? So uh, you're going to set the stage at various points in this. You're going to have to put on and take off your tinfoil hat, right? Because we're going to make some assumptions here. But I'm just going to, this is what actually happened. So there was a Nixon Foundation seminar, which I did not know that that was a thing. I don't know what the Nixon Foundation is. I didn't look into it, but interesting. Um, So there's a foundation seminar where Peter Thiel was talking. uh, And what he was actually talking about was the relationship between U.S. and China, specifically as it relates to the monetary system. And he made this comment. um, There was a clip that's gotten shared on social media a whole bunch of times at this point that you could consider Bitcoin as a financial weapon for China to use against the United States. He also said that the euro, he actually said before he mentioned Bitcoin, he did bring up that the euro uh, could be a Chinese financial weapon against the United States as well. Um, There are a lot of things to unpack. I think in Till's statements, there were three big takeaways for me that we wrote up in our newsletter um, last night, uh, two of which he directly stated, which I thought were really interesting. And then there was one that was kind of implied um, as well to cover. And a lot of this nuance got got lost on Twitter, uh, yeah. obviously. I, I think you nailed it in your newsletter on Thursday. Uh, it was the most uh, objective read. I think people on, on Twitter, at least, just take sides immediately. But it was pretty down the middle, fair. And, and I loved your line about how if Bitcoin is going to become, you know, a global asset class, then the rhetoric around it needs to change. I thought that was real powerful. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, Twitter is where nuance goes to die, right? Yeah, and it's, yeah. You know, <laughs> it's and it's just it's frustrating. It's actually a pet peeve of mine, just about the space in general, which is, I kind of think, you know, when Bitcoin was getting started, it needed that extreme rhetoric, it almost as like a marketing tactic, because when you're a startup. Get, get your name out there, right? You need a, co- a community, almost like a cult behind you. But at a certain point, you reach scale and that doesn't that tactic doesn't work anymore. It's almost like, you know, a founder is really good at taking a company from zero to 60, right? But then you need to kind of bring in a CEO. It's a very rare founder that can actually take a company from zero to all the way to 100, 
except for me, of course, this doesn't apply to me, but like to other, <laughs> other founders just probably struggle that. with that. Right. I was just like prophesying my own death here. Yeah. Um, felt a little weird. Um, the irony. But, yeah. The, I know the irony. All right. Let's get into that with what Peter Thiel said. So I think there are the three things to pay attention to two things that he directly said. One, he did call the Euro as well, uh, a, a Chinese financial weapon against the U.S. And I think what he's just talking about there is the transition away from U.S. dollar hegemony. So that's takeaway number one. Number two, he also said that the Chinese would not want the renminbi to be the next global reserve currency, which I thought was very interesting, um, especially based on what they're doing around their own central bank digital currency. Um, and then the third thing, which maybe we can actually start with, he didn't expressly state this, but I think it's implied that the U.S. is heading towards some sort of cold war with China. That's when the audience, you guys got to put your tinfoil hats on because we're going to we're going to make. Some See, statements. I don't even think that that that's that tinfoil. Yeah, for me, it's like it's already here. But yeah. OK, well, so you know what's not tinfoil about this is there are the U.S. and China are moving into more direct conflict with one another. Right. And you've seen that uh, both direct like that's been probably exacerbated. Um, throughout the Trump administration over the last four years, but it doesn't actually look like Biden is doing a huge about face. And you've seen it, you know, the evidence of this uh, kind of conflict is you've obviously seen the trade, if we're not gonna call them trade wars, we can at least call them trade skirmishes. You've seen territorial disputes around the South China Sea. And I think you've just seen um, increasingly hostile rhetoric uh, from some pretty senior officials uh, in both parties, let's say Trump aside, right? So, you know, on the Chinese front, we did see um, in 2019, Yuang Peng, I really hope I'm pronouncing that right, of the China Institute for International Studies, said that the, fin the financial crisis initiated a shift in the global order. And then he went on to predict the possibility of a Cold War with the U.S. moving from a superpower to a major power. U.S. does not like talk like that. This is a senior Chinese official saying that, you know, a shift in global order, that's a pretty big call, right? You know, people over here don't like that kind of talk. You know, back in August of, of 2020, there was a GOP uh, congressman, Scott Perry. He introduced something called the Name the Enemy Act, uh, and that would officially prohibit U.S. government officials from referring to Xi Jinping as president, instead referring to him as general secretary or something like that, on the basis that he was not a popularly elected leader. And I think this actually all culminates, if, if you remember around uh, the NBA back in October, they were criticized for apologizing to the Chinese National Party for some things that people said. And there was such outrage online. And there was this letter that both AOC and Ted Cruz signed together in a united way, which at that time was just like, oh my God, I've never seen those two people in agreement on anything. What, what was so fascinating, I, you got to love like hypocrisy. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to dig into. But the, the NBA, you know, externally preaches, you know, Black Lives Matter and all these like um, cultural advancements. But then they support China, who's pretty much creating genocide against Uyghurs. And that I just can't reconcile that in my head. But it is fascinating, like you said, that you have both ends of the spectrum, AOC and Ted Cruz, supporting, um, you know, anti-China uh, rhetoric. So I do agree with you there that that there is a uh, hundred percent backing from from the U.S. politically in this realm. Yeah, I mean, it's really rare today, right, to get anything that feels bipartisan at all. And actually, taking a stand against China might be one of the most, might even be the only uh, bipartisan issue in U.S. politics today. So that kind of tells you a little something about the current macro landscape, right? That's a significant thing. I think. For sure, for sure. Um, yeah. So, you know, you're seeing the U.S. and China move into more and more direct conflict. And a lot of this, um, you know, is indirectly related to the monetary system and the way that it's set up. And one of the biggest problems that we're seeing in the United States today, right, is this rise in economic inequality. Uh, and the Fed gets a lot of uh, flack for that. But really, there is a structural problem with having the U.S. dollar be the global reserve currency. And I think China, you know, to Teal's second point about why China would not want the renminbi to become a, uh, a reserve currency, I think they actually kind of realize this. 
there, there are two elements to this, which is one, they don't want to do things like open up their capital account. Obviously the Chinese, they don't love perfect transparency, but I also think that they looked at what has happened to the United States over the last 50 years or so. And because we are the goal, uh, the US has the global reserve currency in the form of the dollar, there is persistent structural demand from other economies in the world to trade in dollars. It's like 80% of global trade is denominated in US dollars. What that means is the United States essentially has to ship those dollars around the world to other countries. And maybe it was tenable in the 1940s, right? When, when the US dollars uh, reserve status was decided at Bretton Woods, the US made up a huge share of global GDP. Today, we make less and less and less uh, of a share of global GDP. And that means we have to export more and more and more of our dollars. And what that's meant is a very strong dollar um, which has led to, you know, we've essentially exported a whole bunch of our jobs overseas, right, to China. And, you know, since the 80s, according to the World Bank, 850 million people have been lifted out of poverty in China. That's phenomenal. You wonder how they did that. Look no further than what's gone on in the United States, where we're seeing record economic inequality, right? Those are very, very related things. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and not many people, it's, it's, they don't want to talk about it, but it's very, it's very, uh, we're going to have to talk about it. And, and I think that's probably the, the uh, polarization of politics is, is, is kind of forcing us to. Yeah. You, you, I saw you tweeted out something pretty interesting just about 10 or 15 minutes ago, just about HSBC uh, and kind of capital controls and all that kind of stuff. You want to talk to us a little bit about that? Because there's the whole capital co uh, control aspect of this as well. Yeah, yeah. Because they have a closed capital system um, in, in China and and uh, Hong Kong, basically the Hong Kong dollar is pegged, right, and to the U.S. dollar. Mm -hmm. And HSBC just recently, it looks like, stopped any buying of cryptocurrency, uh, whether it's micro strategy stock or anything that's related to cryptocurrency, basically because I think think they're seeing a little bit of an exodus of capital and they're trying to stop that from happening because if they have an exodus of capital they have you know credit problems and a debt crisis etc so what's actually interesting is on one side peter Thiel is saying that you know bitcoin could be a problem for a u.s dollar hegemony or Hegemony? I don't know exactly how you say it. Nobody knows. It's like base or vase. You think it's either way. Nice. I'll say hegemony. <laughs> Sounds cooler. So, and on one side, it, it could be a problem for the U.S. dollar. But if why why then is HSBC blocking trades for digital currencies? If if mm. you know, maybe it's a problem for both economies, right? Mm. It's a problem for, in my opinion. Digital currencies are a problem for pretty much power structures in general because it, it mm. gives you an outlet to put money into value that's decentralized. There's no geography behind it. It's like it's sovereign individual type stuff. Now, <laughs> and I would argue maybe against Peter Thiel in this, it's a bigger problem for centralized power like China. Mm. And that's why you see HSBC banning trades in this stuff. We haven't done it yet. So who knows? We'll see how it plays out. It's a fascinating, fascinating argument. And I think it it's really, really probably above my pay grade. But um, we we should see more more of this, you know, get away from the, the crazy extremist Bitcoin maxi type stuff. Or, you know, the Bitcoins being banned and talk about these things logistically of how they're going to play out. I completely agree. And I think that's where uh, probably an appropriate place to end this whole diatribe is. I think the big question that Teal kind of indirectly asked was if a Bitcoin um, standard, right, become, and Bitcoin becomes the dominant um, monetary asset or monetary system on the planet, who benefits more from that, the United States or China? And I think this is a question that deserves to be seriously asked. If you are a citizen living in either of those countries, you have a huge vested interest in the outcome to that question. I think that the Bitcoin maximalist answer, which is, I don't care, I would become a dissident. That's not, that's not acceptable, at least for me. I am curious about what the answer to that question is. And I think there are strong, question, you know, strong arguments to be made on either side. Um, I guess from the US side of things, 
I think you could actually make the argument that in the short term, Bitcoin will not be good for the United States, but in the long term, it will be. Um, and the reason I think that is because the current monetary system affords the United States some big benefits, right? Um, it allows us cheap access to capital in the form of international creditors, and it affords us this really powerful political tool in the form of sanctions. And it's really hard to give that up. But I think what you're starting to see with this economic inequality is that is going to move to the, if it hasn't already, it needs to move to the absolute forefront of problems that we need to deal with as a country. And I think just structurally, the way the monetary system works right now, you cannot fix that with a dollar at the center of the, at the, center of the monetary system. So in the short term, I don't think it's inconsistent to say that the US will fight tooth and nail to keep the dollar at the center. But at the end of the day, it will probably be better if it loses that battle, I think. Um, and to your point about Chinese capital controls and all that kind of stuff, I, I think you're right. I think Bitcoin is fundamentally incompatible with uh, China's government system. It's a command and control economy. There is no transparency. You do not see into its capital account. I think, I don't know, man, I actually do see the US coming out on top here. Um, but you have to be able to ask the question. Yes, I agreed. And, and have a reasonable combo on both sides, all right? Like, yeah. Yeah, that that's where I I'm at personally, and you know, it doesn't do any anybody any good to say you know one side or the other at this point. I agree, and also if you're just consistently you know coming out and supporting one view, you need to no matter how confident you are in something, you need to be able to articulate the the other side. Otherwise, you probably just don't understand the argument or Agreed. what you're talking about. I firmly believe that for sure. All right, everybody. Put your tinfoil hats away. That, you're right. That wasn't that tinfoil hatty. I thought it was going to be more. Um, yeah. Let's talk about U.S. share buybacks picking up. Um, so I'll just set the scene and I'll let you go off on this because I know you've got a lot of opinions and I feel like I've been talking a lot. So share buybacks are inching back up um, at the same time as insider selling is increasing. You do not love to see those two activities go together. Uh, the previous record for U.S. share repurchases was in 2018. And that was at $806 billion. That number fell to $729 billion in 2019. And then it plunged all the way down to $505 billion in 2020. Obviously, that coincided with COVID. Um, this year, share repurchases are expected to rebound to $651 billion based on projections from S&P. What do you think about all this, Tyler? So this is why I call the public markets essentially a Ponzi scheme. So... Mm -hmm. This is a really short, simplistic way of explaining how the system works. But you have unfunded pensions, which take in taxpayer money. Those That taxpayer money gets allocated towards the pensions, increasingly so. That money goes to invest in fixed income, which is a company issues debt, takes the money in from you know the unfunded pension. They use that debt to essentially buy back shares. And they shrink the floats of their stock meaning less shares are on available in the market, which means the float shrinks and it's easier to push up the price of the stock. Mm -hmm. So so that sort of, uh, since the buyback machine is back, it, it kind of artificially pulls up the prices in the stock market. And I thought this would go away after COVID, but since the Fed basically reliquified the entire market with you know massive QE and... Um, this fiscal stuff, I, I think it's going to be a hard time to short equities. I think you'll still get the, uh, in the, in the short term until like inflation really comes back, meaning like food price inflation, the stuff you can't control. And we're starting to see that a tiny bit, like Chinese PPI just came out at like 4.4% today. Uh, U.S. PPI, I believe, came out higher this morning as well. So those types of things will make you not want to own bonds, right? Or treasury bonds, if you will. Um, certain other types of, of corporate bonds you probably want to stay away from as well. But I'm just surprised in, in the interim that like people, corporations want to issue debt and shrink their float as long as they can. And then meanwhile, this is like the hypocrisy of, of some CEOs is that they are selling their stock options into that buying, which is just such a, 
I mean, a slime ball. If historical, like in in history, is gonna look so bad to those guys. Where it's like, come on, man. Like, can't you do something a little altruistic? Like that is so. It's so obvious, and and books will be written about this stuff, um, longer term. But it's all the same game, which is the the one percent is essentially cornering the float, and then the incremental dollar that comes in essentially pushes up asset prices a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, yeah. And if you look at market structure, so this is, I'm a, I'm a trader, former trader, and this Reform. is where it gets really Reform crazy. Trader. Former trader. So when you trade large, large, I was at a $100 billion fund, and I would trade like, you know, five, 10 million shares of a single stock in a day. And this is where you realize how fucked up excuse my French, that the buyback machine is. Because the liquidity is so bad. If, if I was to trade 100,000 shares, basically you used to be able to trade 100,000 shares with a natural counterparty because there was a lot of different active management reacting in the market. And you wouldn't really move the, the price of the stock. And so you could trade, you could be like 30% of the trading volume and not move the price of the stock. Now, as market structure has changed and more high frequency is like, I think it's like 70% of trading volume now, there is not real counterparties in the market, which means you are, you are hypersensitive to every incremental dollar that comes in because there's not a natural, it's like, I'm not selling to Mike Ippolito anymore. I'm selling to a machine that doesn't hold things for long, has no incentives that are aligned with mine. And so when you have these buybacks, you issue debt and you go and say you're 5% of the trading volume, you can move prices of stocks ex exponentially more just doing a buyback now because the float has shrunk because of previous buybacks. The float has also shrunk trading volume. If you look the past month or two is just going down and down and down. So there's less prices moving. So liquidity is worse. You can increment price sensitivity is a lot higher. And on top of that, passive is taking a larger share of, of the market. And they never sell when things go higher. They only sell when they get outflows, right? Mm. So, so it's like this real crazy game. And it, you'd, you'd picture this happening at the end of a capital versus labor cycle too. Mm. It's just a game kind of rigged towards capital they rigged all of things and they've taken the entire float for themselves and every incremental dollar becomes you know that much more sensitive to the price now right. here's the kicker if you keep going further they can't get the growth out of public equities right and so and they can't get the yield out of public public debt and so what you're starting to see is these unfunded pensions and life insurance companies get pushed further and further and further out on the risk spectrum. Mm. And they, they are now allocating, I think that's to move into a different subject. You're seeing, you know, mass mutual, you're seeing, um, you know, star insurance, Liberty mutual. They, they just did a round for NIDIG, right? These are the slowest, stodgiest companies that just buy like debt. And they're, they're getting into digital assets now. Now, that just shows we might be in for like a raging bull market in digital assets, in my opinion. If, you, if the Fed is providing the liquidity and they're basically saying, listen, we're just going to keep giving money and create booming this debt cycle. And that money is just going to slowly filter all the way down into like the furthest pockets of yield. And I think... That's that that NIDIG news was huge for digital assets. Yeah, it's it's just creating that next huge super cycle in digital assets. Personally, because you can get real yield there, and there's and all the float is cornered over in this public market, and over here it's like a it's a real free market. So that transfer of wealth is happening over into digital assets. I think you nailed it. I think you nailed it. And one of the things that, that never gets brought up in these sorts of discussions is growth. It's the issue of growth. So mm -hmm. when you look at something like share buybacks, if you're a CEO, you've got two jobs. You have to be a cheerleader and you have to be a capital allocator. 
And if you're allocating capital in a public company, you basically got three big buckets of where you can put it. You can invest in organic growth, R&D, you can do M&A, or you can return that capital. And basically share buybacks, in my opinion, are a way of returning capital in a more tax efficient way to investors. So when there are share buybacks that are happening, and by the way, companies are horrendous at deciding when to do share buybacks. They're like the worst ever. They're basically saying, I, I don't know what to invest in within my own company. I'm not sure where the growth is going to come from, right? And I think I'm going to get a better return on my capital if I just plop it into my stock in the stock market. So the reason why digital assets I think is so interesting is because it is a growing industry. And at the end of the day, these companies, they got to find growth somewhere. And this is a growing industry. And it's growing. And this, this is the perfect transition into the next subject, which is Coinbase earnings. You're seeing real, real huge growth there. And that's, that's real, right? And so yeah. everyone, you either do buybacks and artificially enhance your, your company through financial engineering and leverage, or you can kind of go out into this new world where like, that's where everyone is being pushed, right? And the Fed doesn't even realize they're doing this, but that's sort of what's happening. They don't get the system. Yeah. Let's talk about Coinbase because they had monster Q1 earnings. Yes. So it's going to give you a high level and then give me your take. So Coinbase, they logged $1.8 billion in revenue for Q1 compared to $1.3 billion for all of 2020. And 2020 was already a blowout year. In terms of net income, they have reported 730 to 800 million compared to 322 million in 2020 and a loss of 30 million in 2019 which is nuts. <laughs> that is that is absolutely nuts. And you know what, when you think about where Coinbase is trading, $100 billion valuation, sounds like a lot, right? But if you look at companies like Snowflake, Coinbase looks like a freaking value stock compared to <laughs> Snowflake. Yeah. Which is nuts. That Snowflake is like the toppiest top company, in my opinion. Yeah. Sorry if you love Snowflake, but um, <laughs> I don't know, man. Real growth. And, you know, What's so great about this too, about Coinbase is they're going to get some insane valuation from the market, which they're, they're kind of getting, they're getting a high valuation. It's going to encourage other public or companies in crypto to go public. Yeah. And there are other companies where it's not public information yet, but they're doing not at the same scale, but they're putting up huge numbers. And those are all going to find their way into public markets, either via direct listings or SPACs or traditional IPOs. And that's going to be huge. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and to, here, here's, I think Coinbase, this is, this is my re subjective read on it, is they're going to price this IPO too high. It's going to have a Facebook sell the news. I don't know if you remember Facebook's IPO, but they actually were overhyped and it sold off. But like nothing really changes the secular outlook, in my opinion. If you have high yield bonds trading at like 2.95% premium over treasuries, you're like, okay, yeah, this is still going to be here, you know, especially if the Fed just stomps out all the risk. So I think if it prices over $150 billion, you're going to see a sell the news. If it's like anywhere from like 100 to 125, I think. It'll still get bought, but yeah, over over 150, I think you start to get the supply problem where every other company rushes to do a SPAC or goes direct listing, and then the supply issue happens. Let, let's put some context around how big Coinbase's business is. Um, Coinbase has 56 million verified users, 6.1 million monthly transacting users. For context, Charles Schwab has 31.5 million users. I don't know. People have different metrics. I'm not going to, I didn't do enough research here. I don't know if the 56 is directly comparable to the 31. I would guess it is. These are huge numbers. They have 223 billion in assets on their platform. I don't know, man. That's just a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. You know, there's, there's other platforms out there. So I think the biggest risk for their valuation is like the Krakens of the world and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Gemini's and, and all that other stuff. But yeah, that, the numbers are shocking. 
And I really, like, what do you, the only thing that could make this blow up is if the Fed just decides to stop printing money, the fiscal authorities stop basically juicing, you know, the economy on that side. What what stops this? Yeah, I, I think that is what stops it. I just don't see there being that much risk in that happening. They just can't let yields rise, right? If anything, I think they're closer to yield curve control than they are anything else. Speaking of which, did you catch that uh, Richard Clarita saying, um, we're going to match all, you know, treasury issuance. We're going to match our purchases with treasury issuance. And I was like, did he just say yield curve control in MMT, like outright? And it, I mean, is it just a big joke by now? It is. Yeah. I, I, I'm with you, man. I agree. Here's, here's one thing that I would like to bring up actually, because it's an issue that we're dealing with in our business and buried in some of that good news for Coinbase before was something that's kind of interesting. So 730 million to 800 million in earnings this quarter, that's unbelievable. In 2019, they had negative $30 million in earnings. And crypto right now, because it is all, Bitcoin is the bellwether and it's got this four year supply schedule that creates huge, Crypto is the mother of all cyclical industries. And I've actually argued before that's positive because sentiment tends to trail price. So when there are these huge run-ups, it actually pulls in the next uh, generation of uh, funds and entrepreneurs. But at the same time, like I kind of look 30 years into the future, is that sustainable? People hate cyclical industries. They suck because it's really hard to do planning, right? Like we're struggling that with that with our business right now. I'm sure other other folks are thinking about the same thing. So at some point, there's cyclical risk that tends to get priced into valuations. And look, I'm not going to go ahead and say I think that's going to show up in Coinbase. I do not think that's going to show up in Coinbase's valuation. You should probably buy it, <laughs> but not not investment advice. But like, I don't know. I, at some point, right, it, the cyclical nature of crypto becomes problematic. I would guess. Do you think? I'm I'm on the other side of the fence here. I, I think cyclicality is the healthiest thing ever. When you have, it's like the, the when you try to suppress volatility, you suppress, you just transmute your risks into other, cyclicality is what's human. It's as day turns to night, that's just natural in a business. It's natural in everything. And the more you try to make things linear, it, it's just, I don't know. I think you sacrifice other other parts of the business. Yeah. So I'm more. Okay. I think it's a natural, you know, human part. Even though like the supply is fixed in Bitcoin, I mean that that keeps people in check, so they don't over leverage, right? Mm -hmm. And and when they do, they have to delever when things are not in favor. So. I don't know. I think that keeps a, a healthy market. Look what's happening in the public markets. That's they're trying to do the linear thing, and now we have like you know social unrest. You have Fed governors. I mean, this is the last thing I'll critique about the Fed. But like next week, I bring this up in the newsletter today. But they're talking about like social issues. They're talking about systemic racism and inequality, and I'm like. Who the hell are you people to lecture me on social, you know, you're supposed to control interest rates and the price of money. And like, I get like, you, you guys ignored this thing for 12 years and said it didn't exist. And now in like a couple months, all of a sudden, like there's systemic racism and inequality and all these like Ivy League people are lecturing me, you know, Ivy League Caucasians lecturing about, you know, social issues. Like that's Congress's job. I don't know, it's, just, it's crazy. Yeah, you know, I'm on your page. You know who? Um, you know where else that's kind of cropping up? That's interesting is in index funds, right? Uh, you know, Matt Levine does some great, it's like semi hyperbole, but you know, in his like in his Matt Levine kind of way. Yeah. And it's you know his question that he asks is should index funds be illegal? And you are starting to see BlackRock, you know, starting to weigh in um, on issues around climate change. Now, but climate change. I am 100% on board, right? People need to be taking that more seriously. The thing is, it's about centers of control, right? Should BlackRock have the ability to do that? Because on the first thing, everyone's on board with. Mm -hmm. and then maybe the second one, not so much. And it's the same thing with Trump getting booted off social media channels. I don't want to make this political. Was that the right decision? 
a lot of people thought so. It wasn't super unpopular with at least some people. But the next one, right, it's the precedent. It's like, should Twitter have that much control that if they deplatform someone, they essentially lose their political voice? Mm -hmm. And that's the question. People don't ask, most people just say, do I want this person to have a voice or not? And you say yes or no, and you either like or don't like the decision. It's not that many people that look at precedent. And what you just brought up, the Fed, their mission creep, right? Their mandate expanding, mm -hmm. and you see it in the form of index funds, that tells you where control is in financial markets. And it's centered with the Fed and it's centered with passive. Dude, and it's all the same thing. You're, 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 you can, you cornered the float of social, you've cornered the float of society where you've now, you're, you're on the margin. This is on the margin, right? Like, plug. That's right. On the margin. <laughs> on the margin. You're, you're trying to make decisions on the margin now to basically create that incremental growth. And like, all these giant institutions have that power. And I think it's just it's it's going to come crumbling down when you get the wage inflation and you get the, the food inflation and the spike in yields. This whole debt bubble is going to come crumbling. And I, I think the new system is going to be there. Um, but it's, it's all just a, a giant ego trip for these people that want to scale forever. And it's the linear scaling thing that gets you. It's like human nature, cyclical, scaling ad infinitum side effects like surprise you know and it's so i'm i i mean like on the whole it's done a lot of good things but on the margin it really hurts it hurts stuff and we're at that point in the cycle where i don't know i just see i can't see it keep it doesn't go on in the same way yeah i agree with you you know in complementary to you know mike green's thing about uh passive and how it's impacting market structure is also the growth of options and how that's impacting market structure as well. We talked um, on the interview portion of this week's show um, with Lily Frankis, and she was talking about the growth of the options market and how that also serves to suck liquidity out of markets, right? As market makers have to hedge their positions, essentially. Um, and you've basically now got these two dominant forces in markets. You've got passive, you've got options. It's sucking liquidity out of markets, and it theoretically is increasing volatility, even though it doesn't really manifest itself like that, right? There are these periods of tranquility followed by huge explosions and blowups. And it all kind of perpetuates because when you have those big blowups, then who do you, you need a backstop? You need the Fed mm -hmm. and that's, you know, or, or central banks in general. And that has kind of become their role, right? To be these central, these backstops. Um, yeah, yeah, which is kind of scary. It's, that's why it's not, it's not really a free market anymore. You know, I, I think you've created a, a basically just a giant Ponzi scheme. And, yeah. and that's the scary part. And I do think there's pockets of, you know, capitalism and innovation. It usually is happening in private markets. Speaking of private markets, the, the, the numbers for the first quarter were records. Like VC funding was like enormous. So they're yeah. trying to get the growth started, you know, in, for the next generation there. I, I agree with that. But, you know, on the whole, it's just like, man, we're, we're in crazy land. We are. I guess that's why, I don't know if you've noticed this, but it seems like there's a lot of very traditional uh, financial professionals who are getting increasingly interested in DeFi, which is pretty interesting. You know, we had a guy, Bill Campbell, he's a portfolio manager at Double Line, um, you know, multi-asset, I guess, hedge fund, you call it. And, you know, he is really interested, you can tell in our talk about what's going on in DeFi. And I think the, which is interesting because if you actually dig into DeFi right now, a lot of problems with it. But I think what you might be able to see, what we're describing right now in traditional capital markets is a system that doesn't really work, right? And it's almost like, okay, we've made this design, but it's so big and hard to, it doesn't really work. And the solution to that is put central banks in there and be like, well, if anything ever really messes up, here's a deus ex machina to just come in and save the day. And it's just, it's a shoddy architecture. And I think why DeFi is interesting is because at least they're trying to make a system where that kind of intervention isn't necessary. Is it perfect? No. Is it anywhere near its final iteration? Absolutely not. Is there some bad behavior? For sure. Is it fundamentally a better architecture? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Could, Definitely. Couldn't agree more there. And what's yeah. fascinating is guys like at Double Line, they're, they're obviously fixed income shop. And yeah. if they're looking at this stuff, they they kind of get that interest rate risk is is huge and if you're getting yield out in DeFi land i mean 
Here's something. By the way, I will preface: they're they're not involved in DeFi, but this guy was interested in it. So, yeah, and that's the yeah. beginning. That's how it starts, right? Right. Right. I I mean, all these. If if you're buying bonds, if you're in the business of buying bonds, you're everybody that I know is doing it is just like, oh my god, like, where the hell do I put my money? Like, this is scary. If you're a baby booner that owns bonds, you probably do in your sixty forty portfolio retirement account. You you don't get it yet. But as soon as that inflation hits, you're going to be like, oh, my God, I'm losing money. My treasuries just fell 20%, you know, long-term treasuries. Um, and so they're all sniffing at DeFi because that money is seeping in there. There's huge yields, huge yields, right? Like relative. I mean, relative. one place I went, and this is like not a plug for them, but like stacks is is you can generate, you know, 20% plus – interest on basically Bitcoin interest by buying stacks and, and stacking your stacks. And I, I think you're probably seeing the beginnings of those those fixed income people trying to get some yield because they have all these, they got to pay out the policemen, the teachers, all these people, and they're going to have to go there. It's just a fact. Either that or you're going to get like the biggest leverage buyout M&A action in public markets in Companies are just going to shrink, and the supply is going to shrink, and they shrink, and shrink, and shrink, and the Fed's going to just stay there the whole time. So we wrote about this, like, there's one of the articles that we launched with, actually, but it's amazing to me that more people haven't drawn the comparison between fixed income markets and DeFi. I guess the reason it's not amazing is because people think of bonds, you know, fixed income instruments as being very stable, whereas DeFi is like the most volatile asset ever. But when you actually dig into it, a lot of these are credit-like instruments. And a lot of the alpha that people that are playing around in this market have is understanding how these protocol works, which is not that different at the end of the day from hedge funds like Paul Singer's, um, you know, really reading into these deep contracts, these these debt sort of contracts and like taking Argentina into international court. Right. Yeah. It's kind of similar if you really think about it at the end of the day. And as evidence uh, that I'm not alone in thinking like this, if you look at Parify, which is probably the most sophisticated, um, at least DeFi fund that, that I know, they call one of their funds, the flagship funds, the credit opportunity fund. So I don't know. I think that that's pretty interesting. Yeah. At the end of yeah. the day, man, you're just analyzing buyers and sellers. And, and yeah. yeah, if the sellers around you have credit problems, get the hell out. Right. And, but, but I don't, you know, you're not seeing a huge uptick in delinquencies anywhere right yet mm. basically because you're just backed people are bailed out left and right yeah. and if they, you do see delinquencies you see student loan delinquencies the laws are just going to change like we are heading into a secular turning point in inflation and i, th I think it's just all going to end up over over in that system and not this one i agree i agree all right, we're running low on time. We were going to talk about this next story, which is State Street is lending its technology um, uh, to an institutional trading platform. The platform is called Pure Digital. It's an interbank trading venue that aims to be the standard for banks. Uh, Pure is building its product with a consortium of banks. They're going to act as liquidity providers, custodians, clearers, etc. I'm going to say two things about this. One, this is great. I, this is kind of the interesting counterpoint to the non-interesting counterpoint last week that we talked about Morgan Stanley adding Bitcoin to their funds. Like that's not as interesting. This is real um, infrastructure type stuff. I, I want to actually pose a question to people. This is happening the opposite way that I would have actually thought that it would have happened. I would have thought it would be a crypto company white labeling its technology suite to State Street so they can take advantage of the brand. And it looks like it's actually happening the other way. I guess the reason is I guess the first reason that I would guess is because if it's if they want a consortium of banks behind it, then they can't really make it State Street. Instead, they all got to kind of support this trading venue that's not associated with any of the banks. But I, I actually it's it's kind of bamboozling me because it's the opposite of what I would have thought. I don't know. So, Do you, so know? you thought like, you know, Gemini would provide its services to State Street or vice versa. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. And, and yeah, I think the the here this goes back to my point about like compliance and all this other crap. And there's all sorts of legal stuff 
now in the the legacy financial world where it's easier to build those things internally and essentially like know all the the compliance nonsense if you were to get an outside person to do that it would really be really be exceptionally hard yeah okay well i you, you i mean you would know better than me so that's probably the right answer if anyone listening to this has a better understanding or something that Tyler and I are missing, hit us up. My email is michael at blockworks.co. You know when you're going to drop yours? I don't want you to get bombarded. You're already on the newsletter. Email. Yeah, hit me on Twitter. Tyler at blockworks.co. All right, so hit us with hit us with answers, everyone. Um, all right, man, we got like five more minutes. What are, you, what are you up to this weekend? You have big plans? Um, Not really. I think I'm just going to rest. I mean, the, the, the Vax thing nailed me. No one tells you. No. They're like... Yeah, second, sorry, second really Pfizer that reported backs. anywhere. Mm, yeah, it's really tinfoil hat time. Right. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just um, what are you doing? Well, it was your it was your son's first birthday. Oh yes. Oh, right. well, and this is uh, probably a little bit personal, but my my son had uh, his heart was backwards, and mm-hmm. he had this thing called transposition of the great arteries when he was born. And so what they do is they um, basically do open heart surgery within the first, you know couple days of his life and flip the arteries back correctly Mm -hmm. and it was like kids used to die uh you know doing this all the time and he hit his you know we we got it flipped back right he's growing really well um and he had his first birthday so big big uh first birthday for mac neville oh man we are very very happy a very happy first birthday man Oh Very yeah, oh that. yeah. So so that happened this week, which is awesome. Did he put his Bitcoin onesie on? Yes, ho- hoddle me. Yeah, thank you for that. By the way, <laughs> that was great. <laughs> what are oh, you guys God. up to? Uh, what am I doing? I'm I've uh, I'm actually seeing my old boss tonight. He's coming over here. We're doing a little spread. Um, you know, of tacos, eating some tacos, playing some board games. Love that. I've what skipped a couple of years. I'm now 45 years old. This is what I do on Friday nights now. Um, <laughs> Dude, and I'm like, that's excited. great. What, I'm what you, what's that game that everyone's playing now? The board game. It's like um, I forget the name. Damn it. What do what do you play? Is it uh, Cards Against Humanity? You know, there's a. We both started as a consultant before this, and so is he. He's a consultant. This game, it's like Cards Against Humanities, but for charts, and they kind of have these funny charts, and you fill them in with your. I forget. I'm gonna butcher it, but it's cool. I'll, that, next, we'll check back in. I'll tell you the name of this. Yeah, yeah. Let me chart know what you play chart game or something like that really outing myself nerd here uh i'm gonna play a chart themed board game at the, like, Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> mike does have a, a, a girlfriend by the way <laughs> yeah that's true that's it's true. not she's just him she's, playing, she's playing the chart game with us too yeah. she's thrilled i'm sure thrilled um <laughs> that's awesome actually you know what i gotta do i gotta find a propane tank you got a grill set up but i have no idea where to get propane i called apparently it's really hard to find propane in the city interesting so. dude in texas literally they have like it's you dig five feet in the ground and get propane so there's like propane everywhere there are people that oh, deliver really? it to your house it's like there's like apps it's like propane you want it we got you <laughs> we got you propane yeah. propane here get your pro- yeah, yeah apparently it's different. really difficult here i wouldn't have thought i thought you know i could get it wherever but yeah fascinating no, not. yeah all right tyler this has been a great episode my friend yes till next, till next week. week jinx Take care. See ya.